Um, welcome everyone. Uh, I think it's good if you make a start to this event today. Uh, those of course that are flowing in a bit later can flow in whenever they want, make sure theatre is open. Um, so first of all, welcome to each and every one of you for making it today. I'm very pleased to have you here. Um, today's event is, as you can see, about the future of Iraq and with a special focus about what might or might not happen to the country after the planned US troop withdrawal later next year. We've got a very special guest speaker here today to talk about that, of course, and that is no one less than Professor Charles Tripp. Uh, Professor Tripp is, as I'm sure some of the students at the front will know, Professor of Politics at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Uh, he is especially known for his writings and uh, publishings about the Middle East, about Islam, and with a specific focus um, on Iraq. Indeed, he's the author, the best-selling author of a, the book, A History of Iraq. Now, before we start the event and I hand over the words to uh, Professor Tripp, I'd just like to mention that we have a Q&A session after this. What we plan to do is about half an hour or so um, having a lecture from Professor Tripp on this subject, and then followed by an opportunity by you, the audience, to get involved and to get any questions or uncertainties that you may have uh, addressed by Professor Tripp. Um, as I'm sure all of you, or most of you who are here today, are aware of, um, we've got a great, great diversity in the nation that is today Iraq. Um, and the big question now, of course, is how that nation, which is so diverse in terms of the amount of religions that are present within the country, the amount of religious groups that we have, and also the amount of ethnic groups that we have within the country, so we've got the Kurds, and we've got the Arabs, and the Turkmen, and so forth, and so on. Um, the big question is how that country, how that diverse nation will come to cope after the planned US troop withdrawal next year. And um, we'd like to ask Professor Tripp to share with us some of his views on this very important topic indeed. Um, now, I'm sure that most of you, like myself, will have plenty of questions on Iraq as it is today and about the future of Iraq. And I'd just like to encourage you all to please to be to try to be involved in the Q&A session afterwards because I personally think that this is a perfect opportunity uh, to get any remaining questions that you have addressed from an academic point of view. Um, so having said that, I'd like to say no more, I'd like to take no more of your time and I'd like to welcome you to Professor Charles Strip for a lecture on this. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Charles Strip. Raz, thank you uh, very much indeed, and thank the PPS at um, Imperial College for inviting me, um, and putting me in this rather ambitiously large uh, lecture hall, but uh, I very much appreciate it. Also, I feel that somehow there's a kind of contradiction in the um, advertisement for the talk, which is I'm billed to talk about the future of Iraq, but I'm also billed as someone who um, met with Tony Blair and gave him advice, but if I know what the future of Iraq was, do you think I would really hear, um, in a sense, the advice counted for anything at all? Um, I could say something about that. I would say something about that in the lecture, but obviously in the Q&A, people could ask me about the, the curious encounter in November uh, 2002, uh, when uh, not just myself, but a few others, uh, tried to um, suggest to Tony Blair and to Jack Straw that the invasion and the occupation of Iraq would perhaps be more complicated than they had reckoned with up to that point. Um, anyway, uh, I can do that in the Q&A. What I wanted to talk to today was what I was asked to, to think a bit about, as Rad said, which is to think about the future of Iraq. Obviously, <laughs> I cannot predict the future of Iraq. I can't predict the future of um, the vote in Parliament uh, in the next couple of days. I can't predict the future of, of politics. But what one can do is think about what kinds of things need to be taken into consideration when thinking about the future political development of Iraq. And to some extent, it's worth just saying something very briefly about recent history. And by recent history, uh, I do really mean recent history. In other words, the last two years uh, in uh, Iraqi politics, the, which in many ways set the foundation for an aspect of what one might see emerging uh, in the next uh, few years, I think, in Iraq itself. So, I think one of the things to bear in mind is that despite the terrible things that happened in Iraq in the Civil War, effectively, from about 2005 to 2007-8, in 
the period 2008-2010, the last two years, what one's seen emerging is the central state again, something which was uh, wiped away by the invasion in 2003, um, and something which, uh, in being wiped away, opened out all sorts of possibilities for non-state actors to make their mark uh, in uh, Iraqi society and Iraqi politics. Some of those, of course, have now come found a new affection for the state itself. Um, but uh, one could argue, therefore, that what you've seen in the last couple of years is the re-emergence of the central state in two senses. Um, one, uh, the notion that the institutions of the central state are beginning to re-establish themselves. What one thinks of as the representatives of the state, that is, uh, government ministries, administration, bureaucracies, but also uh, in, a, in one form or another, political institutions of the state. Uh, the uh, parliament, uh, the local government, um, the prime minister's office, and so on. Um, but again, the other thing that one has to think about in terms of the way in which the state is being reconstituted is to think about the coercive power of the state, which has also been reconstituted. In fact, it would be very difficult to think of the uh, re-establishment of the power of the central state in Iraq without thinking about the way in which it, uh, it needed coercive power to achieve that goal. And as Raz said, when one thinks about the American withdrawal of Iraq, we think about the American troop withdrawal from Iraq. Uh, we don't necessarily think about the American withdrawal from Iraq, and I'm not sure the Americans think about that either, which is of concern to some in Iraq and some in the region too. So there is very much in the framework of the rebuilding of the Iraqi state a powerful um, motive, or a powerful motif rather, uh, which is to some extent due to the fact that Iraq was invaded militarily in 2003, and that is of course the role of the military in the reconstitution of the state. The reconstitution of the state has also taken another pattern in terms of the power of the central government. At the head of that central government, although not initially thought to be a very powerful or charismatic figure, uh, is Nouri al-Maliki, uh, the present Prime Minister. Uh, of Iraq. And in some ways, rather like Anwar Sadat uh, in 1970, uh, rather like uh, if people listening to the radio uh, uh, replaying of I Claudius uh, in the Roman Empire, Nouri al-Maliki to some extent was allowed to become Prime Minister because nobody thought he was a, a threat to anyone else. In other words, there were much more vicious and powerful people uh, who were rejected in some senses. Uh, because they seemed to tread on the toes of others. And there was a general feeling that uh, Nouri al-Maliki couldn't do as much harm as anyone else. He had no real power base. Adawa was a finished party in most respects. It didn't seem to be powerful. Uh, on the scale of who commanded what kinds of militias, uh, his was uh, quite a small and modest one. So uh, it's not as if he, he became, in some senses, prime minister by default. Of course, that's always a terrible mistake. People often appoint the people, they, the person they think is going to be not such a threat, who turns out to actually make the office something quite powerful. And I think one of the features of Nouri al-Maliki, uh, which in many senses has assisted in the rebuilding of the central state, is that he was not a federalist. And by not being a federalist, in other words, not believing that a federal solution was the solution for uh, Iraq itself, except in one respect, and that is uh, with regard to the Kurdish uh, regions of the north of Iraq, um, he, in a sense, tried to pose and put himself forward as someone who would reconstitute the state as a central unifying power. So, in many ways, he got lots of support from people who may not have liked him very much, may have been mistrustful of his party, uh, didn't like some of his friends.